Next up, we have Apom and Ambipom. The former has been around since Generation 2, where it captured fans' hearts with its cuteness and the ingenuity of its tail hand design alike, as demonstrated in the third Pokemon movie. In Gen 4, Apom evolved into Ambipom, which remains one of the coolest cross-generational evolutions to date. This was fully taken advantage of in the anime, where viewers were enamored with Dawn's Apom turned Ambipom. Today, we'll be examining if these two got up to any monkey business in the competitive scene, or if they weren't as dexterous as their tails would suggest. And so, we ask, how good were Apom and Ambipom actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Apom is completely and utterly unviable in GSE. Outside of its decent speed, its stats were utterly atrocious, which, when combined with its complete lack of resistances, ensured that Apom was completely incapable of making even the slightest use out of its decent move pull. Even down in NU, there was no chance it could eke out a role as the world's most niche baton passer. Well, technically it could, but it would be because you wanted to use Apom for the sake of using Apom, not because it had any sort of competitive viability. And here's a sentence you never thought you'd hear. It was entirely outclassed by Farfetch'd. Thus, Apom saw no use in its debut generation. Apom's Generation 3 saw it receive Pickup and Run Away, both of which were boons to the single-player playthrough. Competitively, though, the generation was nearly identical to its debut, even down in NU. There was no place for any baton-passing antics thanks to its utterly horrendous stats and typing, and this is even with Apom receiving Taunt to shut down phasing moves and being able to pass more boosts thanks to the addition of Pinch Berries. Its speed wasn't nearly enough reason to ever use it over Mawile's superior typing and Intimidate. There was no chance of Apom showing up its power issues with Choice Band because it was completely, utterly, and entirely outdone at that by Raticate, one of the tier's topmost threats. Focus Punch wasn't enough for a differentiating factor when Apom was so much weaker and slower than Raticate. Not to mention Apom didn't threaten much of anything at all, so it was just about never able to successfully pull a Focus Punch off. Once again, Apom was completely useless in Generation 3. Generation 4 bestowed upon Apom a much needed evolution in the form of the awesome Ambipom, which received several notable buffs and was able to give the Apom line its first instance of competitive success. While Ambipom was still on the frail side, it at least wasn't as paper thin against even neutral attacks as Apom had been. Plus, it made up for this frailty with its offensive capabilities. 100 attack was solid and 115 speed was absolutely terrific. Its power was also buffed beyond just its attack boost thanks to the additions of Life Orb and an improved Silk Scar. It also received the perfect ability, Technician, which powered up for the litany of low power moves its move pool consisted of. Among these moves was its newly accessible Stab Fakeout, which hit quite hard for a free hit, thanks to all the boosts going into it. Indeed, it became Ambipom's competitive calling card, as did the fact that Ambipom was almost always seen as a lead. Fakeout was particularly valuable to break Focus Sashes, and starting off the game with free damage was generally valuable. Ambipom didn't slow down after the first turn either, as it was able to continue spreading spreading damage and start its team off with momentum thanks to another excellent move it gained, U-Turn. Bulkier Pokemon would tank these lighter hits well, but Ambipom could choose to run Taunt, which combined beautifully with its blazing speed to prevent early entry hazard setup, another great trait for a lead. Offensive Pokemon were not nearly as safe against Ambipom. Not only did it outspeed even those already considered fast, it hit them quite hard. Its powerful stab return was complemented nicely by its coverage options, with low kick tripping up heavy rock and steel type and a technician boosted payback or pursuit, smacking ghosts, with the latter even giving Ambipom the potential to pull off some trapping, giving it even more utility. Ambipom was somewhat popular in OU throughout the fourth generation thanks to its fast fake out, U-turn, and taunt, but it never saw high level usage, as it struggled with so many Pokemon in the metagame, especially the Rotom form. However, it was solid in UU, whose lower power level was the perfect environment for Ambipom to shine in. It outsped and ripped through the tier's offensive Pokemon, even those already considered quite quite fast in Scyther and Miss Magius, whether naturally or with its free hit fakeouts. Its return was strong against neutral targets, dealing heavy damage to even naturally bulky targets like Moltres, and its powerful fakeout was an excellent tool against Pokemon that made themselves faster through Choice Scarf or Dragon Dance. It also destroyed the few Pokemon that outsped it naturally, like Swellow and Alakazam. Sure, the tier had plenty of bulkier Pokemon that could take Ambipom's hits like Registeel, Rhyperior, and Spiritomb, but Ambipom would simply taunt them and U-turn out, preserving offensive momentum. Ambipom was a 
especially vicious on spiking teams, as they provided the extra push that put bulkier Pokemon like Venusaur and Milotic into range of its returns, made Registeel, Rhyperia, and Spiritomb even more reluctant to come into its U-turn, and every bit of chip damage was crucial for getting the most out of Fake Out. Ampipom was frail, but it even had the slightest defensive utility that allowed it to get on the field past turn 1, as its ghost immunity allowed it to pivot into Shadow Balls from Miss Magius and Rotom, and deal a devastating pursuit. Ampipom did have trouble switching into other Pokemon though. It usually had to be very aggressive in its prediction to do so safely, and it did sometimes struggle with the choices of its last move. This made it difficult to slot on too many teams. It was only fit for offense, and certain types of offense at that. However, those teams that did find a place for Ampipom found it well worth their while. It darted in and out of battle, denying the opponent any opportunity to find their footing, constantly chipping them until it was time for it to land finishing blows. Ampipom wasn't a superstar, but it had a legitimately solid niche in Gen 4 UU. Apom was sadly outclassed as a normal type fake out lead by Meowth in Gen 4 Little Cub. The cat was considered one of the best leads in the metagame, and for some reason got Technician while Apom didn't, giving it more powerful fake outs. Meowth also could potentially land early sleep with Hypnosis, which Apom could not. Apom's one potential niche was being able to baton past nasty plots, which was a unique trait, and it was the fastest user of this combination, but it was still too gimmicky to work. Its recipients would be hit too hard to safely receive the boost. Thus, Apom was not really ever seen in Gen 4 Little Cup. The 5th generation's immense power creep was bad news for Ambipom, who struggled to make a name for itself in Yuyu. Its biggest problem was that it had absurdly powerful competition as a normal type in the form of Snorlax, who was one of the very best Pokemon in the tier. Snorlax's amazing special defense let it outclass Ambipom both defensively and offensively. Defensively because it had actual defensive utility that made it easy to slot on teams as a countermeasure to opposing threats, and offensive because this bulk and durability afforded it more opportunities to fire off its powerful attacks. Of course, its attack stat far outstripped Abipom as well. The disparity was especially noticeable since Snorlax boosted itself further with an adamant nature, while Abipom had to use Jolly to make the most of its speed tier. Abipom's lack of power also meant it struggled to meaningfully threaten much, since the metagame was so much more naturally bulky with the proliferation of Pokemon like Togekiss, Swampert, and Bronzong, even on offensive team. Offensive Pokemon were far bulkier on average as well. Abipom wouldn't be able to mow through the likes of Mew, Shaman, and Kingdra like it had run through offense in the previous generation. Ambipom Ampipom wasn't truly bad, but it certainly was a far cry from good. If one truly wanted to use a non-Snorlax normal type attacker, they were generally better off with Chinchino, who was a little slower but far more powerful. Better yet, they would forget the Ambipom versus Chinchino debate and just use Mien Xiao instead, which played similarly but was vastly superior as an offensive threat, and also allowed one to run Snorlax alongside it. Sadly, Ambipom's popularity meant it was used too much in Yu for it to drop to Aryu. There, it likely would have been quite a threat. Alas, it was doomed to forever toil without usage in 5th generation Yuyu. Apom had a small niche in Gen 5 Little Cup thanks to its skill link supported Fury Swipes, a highly threatening move against the low HP stats of level 5 Pokemon. With Life Orb attached, it dealt a minimum of a whopping 20 HP to most non-normal resists, meaning it threatened to KO a great deal of the metagame, including top threats like Mianfu with Stealth Rock Up. This devastating wall-breaking potential was huge in the tier that had considerably slowed down from its 4th generation counterpart with the addition of Eviolite. Now, Apom was undeniably threatening, but it was still difficult to fit on teams, as its defensive utility was utterly nile. In addition to struggling to hit the field safely, it got worn down incredibly quickly once it did hit the field between damage from Hazards, Life Orb, and the ever-present Sandstorm or Hail. Nevertheless, Apom and its Fury Swipes had a small place in 5th generation Little Cup. It was tough to make work reliably, but in the hands of a good player, it was terrifying. Ampipom received a bolstered knockoff in Generation 6 and managed to hit Aryu this time around. Sadly, the SSN had sailed. Ampipom couldn't switch in on anything, and if it did manage to switch in safely, it would never be able to exert any sort of meaningful offensive pressure, as it was walled by, well, basically the entire metagame. Most teams were regularly comprised of 4 or 5 Pokemon that completely stuffed Ampipom, and most of the remaining 1 or 2 were hardly in mortal peril against it either. Ampipom had no redeemable qualities whatsoever. In fact, it was so bad, its one set was named DON'T USE AMBIPOM in all caps, and it was blacklisted from discussions, as it provided nothing but derailment. Yet again, it somehow failed to drop to the tier below, where it would have been quite a threat. AMBIPOM's popularity with fans wound up working against it in this regard. Its only notable accomplishment in Generation 6 was getting an entire community to agree it should not be discussed, as well as having its main set to be a warning against its own use. Apom returned 
turn to Little Cup with a buff knockoff in tow, allowing it to remove Eviolites and make its skill link Fury Swipes even more threatening. Additionally, it no longer had to worry about passive damage as much. Hippopotas and Snover were rare, and even if they did appear, their weather was no longer permanent. Plus, the fog helped assuage pressure from opposing hazards. Plus, Apom didn't have much trouble getting on the field with U turn and Volt Switch support from teammates like Mianfu, Archen, Magnemite, and Chin Chow. As such, Apom was able to make the most out of its impressive power and consistently pose a massive threat to most teams. With a little bit of chip, it powered through even bulky Pokemon like Porygon and Spritzy. Now, Apom couldn't exactly spam Fury Swipes with Reckless Abandon, as the move's contact aspect in conjunction with its 5 hit nature could be heavily abused by popular abilities. Larvesta and Ponyta's 30% Flame Body would almost surely incur a burn, while Ferris Seed's Iron Bombs in conjunction with Life Orb racked up a staggering recoil rate of 52%. Nevertheless, Apom was a dangerous threat and had a solid role in Gen 6 Little Cup. Infuriatingly, Generation 7 saw Ambipom encounter the same issue for the third consecutive generation. Granted, it probably wouldn't have been amazing in PU, but it would have at least been decent. In any case, it would have certainly been far better than NU, where it was trapped as a result of its popularity leading to usage in spite of how completely and utterly unviable it was. Once again, it was completely hapless offensively. It would never achieve anything in a metagame filled with Incineroar, Slowking, Garbodor, and Steelix, just to name a few. These were also merely some of the Pokemon that switched in and completely nullified it. It often wouldn't even come to that, since Ambipom had a difficult time beating anything one-on-one -on -one to begin with. There was absolutely nothing it could do. It was so bad that it managed to get blacklisted from discussion. And it's not entirely Ambipom's fault, though. Its awesome design making players completely disregard its viability is an achievement in and of itself. Even if it is a shame that it wasn't given the opportunity to see usage in a tier it would have actually been good in. Oh well. As many other Pokemon have demonstrated, it could have been a lot worse. Apom reprised its role in Little Cup once again in Sun and Moon, its Fury Swipes once again providing it with a place in the metagame as a solid wall-breaking threat. The addition of Mudbray and its defense-boosting stamina ability seemed to hurt it at first, but Apom spun the donkey to its advantage by luring it with Grass Knot, leaving it free to Fury Swipes most everything else. It was once again a solid Pokemon. However, come Ultra Sun and Moon, that changed as it received an utterly monstrous buff in the form of Tail Slap, whose obscene power left the already strong Fury swipes in the dust. Its power was mind-boggling and incapable of being captured with even the most superfluous superlatives. Put simply, it made the bulkiest Pokemon around look frail. It could straight up one-hit KO a full health Vullaby and defensive Mianfu, and it came quite close on Spritzy. Stealth Rock helped seal the deal easily. If that's how well the bulkiest neutral Pokemon took Tail Slap, it should come as no surprise that Apom effortlessly dished out one-hit KOs left and right. Running normal resist wasn't enough either, with knockoff removing even Lights. They were just as destroyed by Tail Slap as non-resist. Ponyard, of all things, could take well over 90%. It also had solid coverage options, so it's not like it was 100% reliant on Tail Slap. Most notably, Fire Punch would destroy Pharisee. As always, thanks to Apom's amazing 19 speed, it outran and threatened the majority of the metagame. Apom wasn't even frail either. It could survive a Timber Mock Punch, which would be enough for it to crush it in return. Some Apom even ran Eviolite. The extra bulk and lack of recoil made it more difficult to deal with Apom through counter attacks, most notably removing Diglett's capability of trapping and removing it. Tail Slap still utterly throttled most Pokemon even without the Life Orb boost. Of course, the astonishing power of Life Orb made it Apom's defensive set. It will not be outlandish to compare Gen 7 Little Cup Apom to Mega Rayquaza in Ubers. Clicking Tail Slap may as well have been clicking a button to delete an opposing Pokemon. To call it terrifying did not do it justice. Apom terminated Pokemon with one click of a button, effortlessly wiping out opposing Pokemon's HP bars. For this reason, shortly after the release of Ultra Sun and Moon, Apom was banned from Little Cup. It was now a Little Cup Uber, reaching the ranks of the legendary Scyther. And you know what? Not bad for what was formerly one of the worst Pokemon in the game. And that's it, so how good were Apom and Ambipom actually? Well, Apom's first two generations weren't too good. Its stats were utterly pathetic. Things looked to be on the up and up in Generation 4 as it evolved into Ambipom, which became a solid UU Pokemon. However, starting Generation 5, Ambipom became stuck in a frustrating loop. It wasn't good enough for the tier it wound up in, but it kept getting used, and thus it did not drop to the tier below, where it would have been quite good. Its continued usage despite a total lack of viability became notorious. It suffered this indignity in all 
of the generations 5, 6, and 7. On the bright side, Apom has had quite a storied Little Cup career. It wasn't worth much in Generation 4, but in Generations 5 and 6, its Fury Swipes turned into a solid wall breaker, albeit one that required some finesse. Generation 7 was another story entirely, though, as Fury Swipes were upgraded into Tail Slap, turning Apom into a one-hit KO machine. It was as if Deoxys Attack had been unleashed upon the tier. It didn't take long for Apom to join the legendary ranks of Little Cup Ubers, the Pokemon that were too powerful for Little Cup play. Overall, Apom and Ampipom have had an interesting competitive career, and we can't wait to see them return in the upcoming Diamond and Pearl remakes. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Red Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Apom and Ampipom? What would you give Ampipom to actually have it be good in the tiers that it winds up in? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow McCrew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.